Ashwin, Jonathan, Hazel, and Damien. And today we'll be sharing on the three priorities, begging the question, complex question, and false dichotomy. Yeah, so this is the structure of our presentation. Firstly, we'll be going through begging the question. Secondly, we'll be moving on to complex questions. And then we'll be talking about false dichotomy, and we'll end off with a quiz. Yeah, so for the first priority of begging the question. So what is begging the question? Begging the question is also known as petitio principle or the circular reasoning. So this occurs when the premise presumes openly or covertly the very conclusion is to be determined. So what this means is that one assumes without proof the stand or position that is in question. And there are three types of be begging the question. Firstly, the omission of premise. Secondly, restatement. And thirdly, the circular case. Yeah, so moving to the first type of um, omission of premise, um, it refers to an argument with an omitted premise. So usually for the structure of a complete argument, it first starts with a premise, and then second we have a premise of immediate conclusion, and then we move to the final conclusion. However, when arguments um, take a premise, um, the second one is missing, so it goes straight from the premise to the conclusion. Um, however, it's important to note that an argument with an omitted premise does not necessarily mean that the argument is fallacious. Because uh, it's important to know that the omitted premise must be controversial for the argument to be a fallacious one. Yeah, so moving on to the example, first example, um, killing people is wrong, so the capital punishment is wrong. Um, do you all think this is um, fallacious under omission of premise? Um, some of you might think so. However, if we were to take a closer look, we realize that the omitted premise would be the one we think, which is the death penalty is a way of killing. However, this premise, omitted premise is uncontroversial and it, um, it's not controversial that death penalty is a way of killing. Therefore, the argument is not fallacious. Hence, a common misconception would be that if some people think that if one of the premise, for example, killing people is wrong, and some people may feel that all killing people is wrong is a controversial premise because there are some justified ways of killing, such as um, the capital punishment for opinion crimes. However, for the, for the um, Priority of omission of premise, it's important to note that um, the focus should be on the omitted premise and not the other premises. And when it's uncontroversial, then it will not be fallacious under omission of premise. Yeah, so now we move on to the next example. Murdering an innocent human being is wrong. So abortion is wrong. Um, would this be a omission of premise? Well, if we take a closer look, we realize that the um, omitted premise would be the fetus is a human being. And we all know from previous seminars that this is a controversial premise because um, some people are may view that the fetus is a human being, while others will be may feel that it's not a human being and it's still a living. Therefore, um, as the omitted premise is controversial, therefore this argument is fallacious and considered as the omission of premise um priority. Yeah, so to um summarize this thing, to avoid omission of premise, there's, there's a way um, there's a few ways of doing it. Firstly, it would be to lay out all the controversial premises explaining, all the premises explaining. And secondly, it would be to write out all your premises and conclusions in a short outline form and see if there are any gaps. Gaps referring to any steps that are required to move from one premise to the next or the premise to the conclusion. Yeah, and um, write statements to fill these gaps. For example, if the statements are, are controversial, then you might be begging the question. Yeah. So now we move on to the second type of begging the question, it will be restatement. So what is restatement? Restatement is, um, is that the premise is a mere paraphrasing of the conclusion, and there will be no independent reason given for the conclusion. So the structure is usually, um, it is true that Y, so it's true that, that X, where Y is just a paraphrasing of X. And usually for these arguments, X and Y are disguised in the fact that they mean exactly the same thing. So for example, in the example of blue example, um, the premise says that X is a trustworthy person because I trust him. And then the conclusion will be thus you should trust X. However, this is a restatement because um, the premise that trust I trust him as well as trustworthy will mean the same thing. And they don't give any in independent reason on why you should trust X. For example, maybe um, he follows through on his promises and, and he's reliable. Yeah, so this is considered as a restatement. So we move on to the next example. Um, smoking cigarettes can kill you because cigarettes are deadly. 
Um, so the first step will be to identify the premise and the conclusion. Um, the green one will be the premise, which is cigarettes are deadly, and the conclusion will be yellow, which is the smoking cigarettes can kill you. And if you take a closer look, um, you realize that the premise is actually a restatement of the conclusion because deadly and it means the same thing as kill you. Therefore, this is the salvation argument under restatement. Yeah. And for the second example, um, we have a slightly more complicated um, argument. It is from the famous philosopher Richard Bradley, book 1826, Elements of Logic. Um, the argument says, swallow every man unbounded freedom of speech must always be, on the whole, advantageous to the state, for it is highly conducive to the interests of the community that each individual should enjoy a liberty perfectly unlimited of expressing his sentiments. So if we follow the steps we see earlier, we first identify the premise and the conclusion. Um, the conclusion will be the yellow one, which is to allow every man unbounded freedom of speech uh, will always be advantageous to the state. And then the premise will be the green one, which is each individual should enjoy a liberty perfectly unlimited of expressing his sentiments. And we actually realize that um, we do not provide any independent reason, and the premise, which is the green one, means the free speech is good for society. So we realize that this example is also a fallacious one under this statement because we do not provide any independent reason of why free speech is good for society but merely paraphrase the same thing. Yeah. So to sum up again, how can we avoid this statement? Firstly, we can check to see if the conclusion of an argument might merely restate the possibly false premise in a different language or word. And secondly, we can see if the premise supports the conclusion or if the conclusion tends to reinforce the premise. And lastly, we can check to see if there's any independent evidence or reason that can support the conclusion. Um, now the director will take us through circular stream. Yeah, so the final, the third and final form of framing the question is known as circular chain. So how this differs from the statement is that, um, as we all know now, the statement is the case where the premises is paraphrased to mean the same thing as the conclusion. However, in circular chain, you can see that the premises are actually distinct from the conclusion. And circular chain arguments also take the form of complex arguments where there are like multiple inferences, as you can see from the arrows, leading to some conclusion leading to their own sub-conclusions. Yeah, so it's very easy for someone committing this fallacy to be able to conceal it within like the multi-layered complex argument that makes it difficult to spot unless you reconstruct the argument. Yeah, here is a simple example of, uh, of an argument that fits into the recognizable structure in the previous slide. So as you can see, a like, um, not all uh, real life examples will fit so neatly into, into this structure as you can see as we will explore in a later example. So as you can see, this um, this argument uses um, uh, claims that Back to the Future is a good movie using the premise that 1980s movies are good. However, if you take a closer look as, as to why 1980s movies are good, you can see that the person exposing this view um, uses a familiar proposition that Back to the Future is a good movie and from the 1980s. So, um, because because the question that Back to the Future is a good movie is precisely the question that is at hand for this argument, this is a classic case of um, begging the question. Yeah, similarly, in this example, um, the circular chain argument is also being used to show that the Oklahoma City Thunder are a bad basketball team. So as you can see in this argument, there's an it's a complex argument with an additional layer. Like there are two sub-conclusions within this complex argument. And this is how many people try to like conceal their um, the basic premise. They are, they are trying to avoid begging the question by concealing the basic premises behind many different layers of circular argument, uh, circular chain arguments. Yeah, so as you can see, um, the the basic premise that is underpinning their, all their other sub-conclusions that they can barely win a play playoff series and they have never won a championship is the roundabout assertion that this team is a bad basketball team. Yeah, to, so to move on to a more complex example, this is a more commonly used example that proves the existence of God. So at first glance, you might, see, you might think that this argument is irrefutable or isn't logical at first glance, but however, 
upon breaking down through the construction, you can see that it contains elements of circular chain argument as well. So in short, um, this argument, this argument uh, tries to claim that God exists, firstly because the Bible says that he exists and that everything in the Bible is true. It then goes on to support this premise that everything in the Bible is true by saying that the Bible is the word of God and that God does not lie. However, for these two, for the, for the second uh, layer to be true, this argument presupposes that God must exist. After all, if God does not exist, uh, say much about whether about what he said as in the word of God and whether or not he lies cannot be substantiated. And because this left side of the argument has unsubstantiated premises, this, this entire argument is therefore unsubstantiated. Yeah, so this is why um, utmost caution must be taken into considering these arguments that contain these elements of um, circular chain argument. And now Hizo will come explain um, complex questions. Okay, so now we come to our second fallacy of the set, and this is the fallacy of a complex question. So you might have also come across this as a loaded question or a false question, and there are a couple other names as well. So what exactly is a complex question? Okay, so here we have two main features that we can use to identify the fallacious type of questioning. So firstly, um, the question usually has one or more like presuppositions, and these are ones that are not proven or are not agreeable. Secondly, they can also artificially restrict the answers that are given, that can be offered, you know, in responding to the question. And another issue is that this can be committed like intentionally or unintentionally. So one could unknowingly swallow in an unsettled question or an unjustified assumption to the question. It's much easier to like, um, visualize this with an example. So this is the first example. So imagine somebody asks you the question, have you stopped hitting your wife? So at first glance, this might not appear to be fallacious, but if we look closer at this, then we can see how this could reflect the fallacy. So in deciding whether this is fallacious or not, we need to consider the context in which we ask this question. So it's only fallacious if, us, if in asking the question, like one has not as yet established whether the person answering has actually ever hit his wife. So assuming that the person um, answering, let's call him person A, he has never hit his wife, the person asking this question would have committed the fallacy. So if the fallacy is being committed, then how would person A respond? So this is the issue with the fallacious question because no matter how he chooses to respond, he has to answer yes or no. And if he answers no, he implicitly admits that he used to hit his wife and has not stopped yet. But if he answers yes, he still admits to hitting his wife before, but he has now stopped. So obviously this is not ideal for person A and he has, uh, because he has never hit his wife. So the only thing left for him to do is to argue against the implicit assumption that he disagrees with, which is that he's hit his wife. And this essentially means denying the whole question. And in doing so, is the only way he can avoid admitting to hitting his wife. So now we'll consider a few real life examples where this fallacy was committed. So the first one was committed in a news article about a politician. So the fallacious question here is outlined and it reads, does he stand for anything other than hunger for political power? So why might this be fallacious? Answering yes or no to the answer always leads to the admission that he stands for hunger for political power. But this could be completely untrue and this man could represent many other possible ideas. We move on to our second example and this is an excerpt taken from one of Marcus Cicero's speeches so for some context, he was a Roman statesman and philosopher, and he's addressing another Roman politician, Catiline. So I have labeled the three different presuppositions. And basically they are that, one, Catiline abuses the Senate's patience. Second, that he exemplifies some manner of madness to mock the Senate. And thirdly, that his behavior displays unbridled audacity. So why is this fallacious again? This is possibly fallacious because Catalin, being on the responding end, 
he's unable to completely re uh, to answer these questions without rejecting any of his suppositions at all. And if he <coughs> wants to do so, he has to completely reject the validity of okay, the so question. Yeah. Okay, so can you go back one slide, and please one slide, and then repeat then this one. Oh, this one? Please this one, okay. and throw out the question. Where's the question? Yeah, then you. Yeah, so these are, uh, so this is the original like, excerpt, and then I took out the two suppositions. So these are the ones that could potentially cause the whole, like uh, the, the three questions to be fallacious. So I thought this was quite a good example because it just shows how like there's a temporal element because they all assume that all these three presuppositions have already been established. Yeah, so it's basically fallacious once again because you cannot reject the presuppositions without completely rejecting the questions. So I'll pass the time on now to David. Hi guys, thanks for listening. I know you must be tired. I'll try to be short. So I'll be taking you guys through the next fallacy, which is false dichotomy. So in short, the false dichotomy fallacy is when an argument presents you with like only two options. It's like kind of like just giving you either black or you can either choose black or you can choose white. Then it ignores any options in between. There's only two options. So this is a type of fallacy, but actually if we cast our minds back to a seminar during before business week, we have actually encountered such an argument before. And it's called a uh, disjunctive syllogism. So a disjunctive syllogism goes like this, right? Um, sorry, wait, huh? It goes like this. Uh, the answer to a question is either true or false. The answer is not false, and therefore it must be true. But the reason why disjunctive syllogisms are valid is because we know that there are actually only two possible outcomes. How can an answer be both true or false, or how can there be any other option in between? And that's what makes it valid. But what makes a uh, false dichotomy fallacious then? So if we see, okay, yeah, so this is a valid argument, disjunctive syllogism. So what makes a valid, uh, I mean, a false dichotomy fallacious then? Is because when we are presented with the same argument type, that either A or B is not A, and therefore it must be B. We have the first type of fallacy, which is non-exhaustive. We ignore the option or we ignore the thought that there are other options in between. Yes, it's A or B, but we ignore the option that there might be C, D, or D. That's why it's fallacious, because it just assumes that there's only two. Then there's the other type, this is, so this is non-exhaustive. There's the other type, which is non-exclusive. It ignores the option that actually A and B can occur at the same time. So how can it be that? It, it's either A or B, and if it's not A, it's only B. You, you get, so there are two types of this uh, fallacy. One is that there are other options in between, and the other ignores that um, A and B can occur at the same time. So let's dive in deeper to understand it more clearly. So for the first one, non-exhaustive um, false dichotomy, right? Yeah, you see, there's a very nice uh, picture on the left, which nicely describes the situation and why it's a fallacy. So it's either black or white, but you know there are other shades of gray, gray in between them. You know? And uh, yeah, it ignores that there are other options in between. So for the first one, uh, my, maybe your, your friend will ask you, uh, you must come with us to the bar tonight, otherwise you'll be bored at home. And since you're not coming to the bar, you'll, be, you'll definitely be bored at home. But there are other possibilities in between. For example, I could have fun at home by myself. So this is where uh, your friend is trying to convince you to come to the bar with you is uh, committing a false dichotomy uh, fallacy because it ignores other options in between. Yeah. So this is a non-exhaustive false dichotomy. Okay, I have another example. So this is the classic. Politicians like to use this, right? You are either with me or you are against me. Since you are not with me, you must be against me. But he casually just ignores the option that maybe I just don't care. I'm indifferent to you. I might not want to be with you. I might not want to be against you. So you can very clearly see that because these arguments um, ignore the other possibilities in between, they are committing a false dichotomy fallacy. So this is one type. You are ignoring other possibilities. Then we go on to non-exclusive, which is that you totally ignore the fact that they can happen at the same time. Right? So there's a very nice Venn diagram also here. So they present you with A or B, but you ignore the possibility that there can be an intersection in between. Whereas A and B also is not mutually exclusive. So one very nice example is uh, this picture here. 
So this is called this picture is called the young America's dilemma, right? So on the left, um, is a guy. Uh, I think he's a manager right, in, a, in a steel mine. He's sitting about a one million dollar year salary, and the other one is actually the chief justice of America. He's sitting on top a very nice uh, wooden box, but I think below is a, it's just a one thousand dollar salary. And then the caption says, "Shall I be wise and great or rich and powerful?" So he's trying to say that if you are, if you choose to be wise and great, like the, the chief justice, and you choose to get only a one thousand dollar salary, you cannot be rich and powerful as well, like the manager in the steel mine. He's not wise and great, but he's earning a lot of money, one million dollars. Yeah. So, but he ignores the fact that. Actually, you can be both wise and great and rich and powerful at the same time. It's, it's not mutually exclusive thing. And this is why it's a false dichotomy. Because it ignores the fact that both options can happen at the same time. So, uh, to sum it all very nicely, I provide, I'm going to provide another a nice example. It's the anti-vax argument. Right? So, a lot of anti-vaxxers will say, uh, if the COVID vaccines actually work, then why are still people getting COVID? It must be because vaccines are not effective. But then this argument, okay, so we reconstruct this argument first. COVID vaccines are either 100% effective or they're not effective at all. And since people who are vaccinated are still getting COVID, they must be not effective. But then this argument ignores the fact that there are other possibilities in between. For example, COVID vaccine merely reduces the fact that infections might occur. Right, so it, it just very casually ignores that uh, it, it just reduces the risk and then it just says that it's either 100% effective or not and it's binary. So this is an example of a non-exhaustive false dichotomy. Yeah. So to sum it up, there are two types of false dichotomy fallacies. It's either non-exhaustive where you ignore the other options in between when you're presented with A or B, you ignore that there might be C, D or E. And then there are the non-exclusive false dichotomies, which is that A and B can occur at the same time. Yeah, okay, cheers. So next, we move on to the quiz. That's a lot. In the meantime, do you all have any questions? Um, anything that confused you? Or are trying to sort out stuff? Yeah, I guess not. Let's feel free to ask the table while we're still sorting it out. So you think I'll put any other thing where like it's max twenty there. So I'm not sure you guys will have to like share the share the with someone else. Yeah, we didn't subscribe to the premium account. So you might have to share your yeah. screens with the person next to you. But nonetheless, still try a try the question. Yeah, the code is there, you can you can feel free to join. Prof, do you wanna join in also? Start. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. 
andare. Yeah, okay, so very, very nice. So I explain uh, oh yeah, it's a, it's a false dichotomy because the, the argument presents you with either you can either stay at your current job or you can live in poverty. But then very clearly there are other you know options in between like you can stay in your current job while I mean you can go find other jobs while you know not be in poverty. Yeah, so very nicely done and Yes, this is a non-exhaustive dichotomy because uh, non non-exhaustive is cast your mind back again. Non-exhaustive is that there are other options in between, while non-exclusive is that both can occur at the same time. So this accords more to the non-exhaustive dichotomy because clearly there are other ways to ensure that the world will not be overpopulated and not everyone will die, while making sure that you don't sterilize third world people. Yep, very nicely done. Arguments are sometimes like complex arguments, so there are like many uh, distinct premises that lead to the conclusion. So, what do you mean by that? Um, it's very difficult to tell at first glance, like for example, the God argument, where you can see that it looks like very legit at first glance, but then you, if you break it down, you can see that whether there are like missing premises or, or things that are related to the conclusion. That's why reconstructing this argument is like, um, it's like a good way to kind of see whether there are these kind of like conclusions leading to itself and then, like self validation. Whereas like um, for paraphrasing the argument and asking whether they mean the same thing, that's a good uh, that's a good method of like avoiding mistake memory is that the the premises like kinda say kinda say the same thing as the conclusion, but then it's like phrased in a different way. Okay, yeah, so the complex question fallacy is committed is like if you try and recall from earlier, if a question presupposes something that is not proven or agreeable. So the rest of the options are just um, like filler options that we picked up from the other fallacies. But basically, yeah, just, just be like cognizant of the fact that if a question is hiding something that you might not agree with or something that has not yet been proven, don't, don't answer the question, you should just completely deny the whole question. So don't fall into the trap of oh, uh, don't fall into the trap of like everything to the assumption that you don't agree with. Okay, so
um, we identify the conclusion and the premise. The conclusion is you must obey the law, and the premise is you deserve to break the law. And we realize that um, we are actually paraphrasing for breaking things because um, anything that's law means that if you don't follow it, uh, you will disobey it, then it's illegal. So, like, yeah, the least statement. Can you just to emphasize like the difference between circular chain and statement chain is that um, circular chain you can't you can't tell whether it's uh, a fallacy just by like rephrasing what it means. For example, in this case, um, by looking at whether breaking the law means illegal or legal. So circular chain is like sometimes like not as obvious. So it's like uh, for example, uh, like Back to the Future, the two movies because it's from the nineteen eighties. It's like it doesn't they don't mean the same thing, so they are different. But then if you look at like the reasons behind why 1980s movies are good, and then if the person says that 1980s movies are good, it's just back to the future, the good movie. That's the case of circular chain rather than the statement. Yeah, because circular chain is usually compared to argument which they want more simple. Yeah. Okay, so now Basically, the option with the highest like possibility of being fallacious is I mean, not not being fallacious is this one, because the rest, if you look through them, like how do you manage to prove the murder? It's possible that it hasn't yet been established that the person being addressed has pulled off the murder, and then the same thing with uh, I used to be an alcoholic is very similar to the have you stopped beating your wife, and also if uh, you are in favor of the ruinous economic uh, policies of the Labour Party, this is not even. Um, really like under the complex question fallacy. Yeah, so most of you got it correct. So basically, um, when like the fallacious complex question has been committed, it can it can hide and like harbor like more than one presupposition that we might not agree with or that uh, has not been proven yet. So that's why like both the answer both is correct because yeah these are the two presuppositions that make the question fallacious.
Regarding these sexualities, 